I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekrastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin. I'm Spencer, and today I'm joined by a very special guest, Vim Venders, the director of the Academy Award nominated documentary, Pina. Um, we're going to get to Pina in a little bit, but I want to start out by talking about your earlier work, um, starting with Paris, Texas. It's kind of interesting to think now, because you've been so successful as a documentary filmmaker, that a lot of your early success came from narrative fiction. I mean, you won, let's see, you won the Palme d'Or and you won Best Direction at the BAFTAs for Paris, Texas. Was What was it about Paris, Texas that sort of drew you to that project? The poetry of Sam Shepard. Do, do you feel like that there's sort of a parallel with sort of documentary film work, though, in some ways? Because I was thinking about it, um, looking back, that it's sort of the story of this man as he sort of goes back and discovers his um, family and life and love and all these other things. It's almost like a documentary in some ways of this guy's life. Do you, do you just look at documentary filmmaking and narrative filmmaking as sort of having an overla overlap or do you, do you approach them completely differently? Well, for once, for instance, we shot, which was insane, we shot Paris, Texas in chronological order, which, wow. is, a, which is a procedure of a documentary. Yeah, film. that is very unusual. That is. Normally, you sh of course, you shoot your documentaries in, docu in chronological order. There's no other way because it's not scripted. <laughs> yeah. But to start in Texas, go to California and drive back to Texas, any producer and production manager you would say you're insane because you would shoot everything in California and then you shoot everything in Texas. But starting in Texas, going to California and then going back to Texas, they thought we were out of our minds. But it was the only way to do it, I felt. We had to, and the actor had to live the experience, and we felt we had to live through his story. So we shot it, the whole thing in chronological order, which, you're right, is a little bit more of a documentary approach than a fictional approach. Did the story at all evolve as you were making the film? Because you talk about, you know, you're going through this experience with him. I mean, I presume that, you know, we got, was it Harry Dean Stanton as the main character there? Did did his sort of understanding of the character evolve as he was doing it? Because he, he I mean, he's living basically this guy's life in some ways, if you're shooting it, especially chronologically. Well, Harry put a lot of his own life into this. And yes, it allowed him to be much more in control of his character, to be doing it in chronological order. The actor is much more in control this way than when you jump backwards and forwards, and if you shoot your ending in the first week and the beginning in the last, the actor sometimes gets lost. So it really put, it does put the actors more in the driver's seat, and it allowed not only Harry, but also us to understand the story better. And us is me and Sam Shepard because we didn't have a completed script. We only had the, wow. we, had only we had only scripted the first half. And from there on, we had to invent it. Wow. And that that's, was one of the reasons we wanted to do it in chronological order, so we could have the luxury to invent it. Because otherwise, if you shoot the ending in the beginning, there's no more freedom. Then you have to shoot everything as it is scripted. You have no choice. When you're making this film, I mean, it's a narrative film, even though you filmed it like a documentary. Did you always sort of imagine yourself as a documentary filmmaker or a narrative filmmaker, or was it something that you never even thought? Because, I mean, there haven't been a lot of people who have crossed over back and forth between narrative and documentary films. It, I mean, it, maybe as a young filmmaker, it didn't even occur to you to be a documentary filmmaker until it sort of happened. Like, what was the process for you as a young director, sort of learning the system and figuring out what worked for you and whatnot? Already when I started out, I had a lot of respect for, I don't know what you would call it, any other word than reality. Sure. For instance, on my first films, I would never say cut. I would... The scene would somehow be discussed with the actors, then we would shoot it. 
And when the stuff that we discussed was over, I didn't say cut. I thought that's when it was getting interesting, when there was nothing foreseen, and when anything could happen, mm. and when something could happen that, like, as simple as a cloud hiding the sun, that was going to be more exciting than anything you could possibly mm. write, or a dog running through the shot, or a bird flying through the sky. Um, from the beginning, I always felt that there was an element of of documenting life in fiction that I really loved. And, I mean, very seriously, because this is called MacGuffin, watching watching Hitchcock's films, mm. like, what other film would give a better picture of San Francisco, let's say, in the late 60s, than, what would you say? Where'd he go? I don't think there could be a documentary shot at that time that would give us a better image of what living in that city was all mm, about mm -hmm. than an extreme fiction. And I mean, Hitchcock is extreme fiction. Yeah. It's really extreme fiction. But still, in extreme fiction, sometimes places, especially places, are very well kept and are very well documented. And from the beginning of my filmmaking, I think one of the senses of my work that was really driving my work was a sense of place. Mm. And I really made all my films because I wanted to shoot in a certain place and I wanted that place to help me find a story that could only take place there and nobody, nowhere else. Paris, Texas, Sam and I had no clue. We could have told a million stories. Mm -hmm. Between the two of us, there were a million stories. I have no doubt. But we found the story when we talked about our favorite places and we, ev when we evoked the Mexican-Texas border and that no man's land there. Mm -hmm. And that's when we both started to talk about how much we liked that and, and that we s remembered the same places, like Marathon is a little town, or whatever you call mm -hmm. it, Talingua. We knew the same places and evoking those places we came up with this character, this man who shows up there in the middle of nowhere. So the sense of place for me is a driving force in my filmmaking, and that might be a very documentarian approach. And I, th I think that actually is perfect that you talk about that, because the other narrative film I wanted to mention of yours was Wings of Desire, which is set in West Germany. And I mean, you filmed it in 87 right sort of before, you know, the Berlin Wall fell. And it's it's got the story of the angels looking down and sort of interacting with life, but it's also got, you know, the discussion of, you know, this actor making this film about Nazism and stuff like that. And it's really, I mean, that, you talk about a, a film that was, had to be set in sort of one place. I mean, just like... Yeah. And the film started not with the story, not with the angels. The film started with the deep desire to make a film in the city of Berlin and to sort of find a way to tell this city vertically and horizontally and to tell the city in the most complex and complete possible way. And I was looking for characters who could do that. And I was thinking of stupid things like mailmen because they get around mm. and, and doctors in ambulances or firemen and none of it, and it was all too limited. It, the story I wanted to tell was a more complete story of Berlin. And one day, in my notebook, I wrote down this st stupid note, guardian angels, question mark, because city, the city of Berlin, and they appear in the film, is full of angel figures everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's really striking. So at one point I wrote guardian angels as possible heroes, and it just remained there in my notebook. Many things got crossed out, and that remained there. As, and in the end, it was the only, it was the only thing that led me to believe I could make a film about Berlin that could actually happen anywhere at any time and everywhere at the same time. And then I took it more seriously, and I realized angels were the perfect characters for a story to be told of Berlin. And it, talk about perfect place at the perfect time, because that was very shortly before you know the Berlin Wall comes down and stuff like that. So it, you you capture a place at a time that 
shortly thereafter in some ways cease to exist. Like it's it's not only a to- a place that you captured, but a time you captured. It is a historic document. You can look at Wings of Desire strictly if you wanted to. You could see it strictly as a historic document of Berlin in the late 1980s before before it became a different planet. Yeah, absolutely. And so you you were doing these narrative films, even though there's a lot of, you talk about place a lot, you talk about character a lot. Eventually, you, in 99, you made the transition to documentary filmmaking proper with Buena Vista Social Club. What exactly was it about that that made you change what you were doing and switch to this other piece of filmmaking? It was, it was the admiration for this music. It was the fact that Rai played some rough tapes of the first recordings he had done in Havana and the fact that I asked him who are the kids you made this beautiful music with and mm. he laughed and that was the moment when the movie was born. Rai laughed and said they are not exactly kids and he said well the singer here that you're hearing now he's 89 He's going to be 90 soon, wow. yeah. and the and the the piano player. He's in his 80s, and I thought he was. I thought these were told stories. Uh-huh. I did not believe it. I said, right there on the spot. Next time you go, I'm coming with you. I want to see these. That's guys. amazing. And that was the beginning of the movie. And I forgot about it. And six months later, he he called me and said, "I'm going. I'm going next week. Are you coming?" And that's how we made the movie. And so it wasn't necessarily that you were interested, I mean, you were interested in the music, but it wasn't something you were necessarily conscious of before it was brought to your attention. It's it's kind of amazing that you can do a film so vibrant about music with it not necessarily being a a lifelong passion or something. How did you find, you know, how, how did you find a way to sort of portray music on film that could convey that sort of passion that these musicians have for the project i mean it seems like well, a challenge music is my lifelong passion it, oh, is. There we go. it is my life and finding these old men who had sort of believed in what they were doing against all odds and actually when we started to work Ibrahim was shining shoes still <laughs> and actually really put everything on the line for their music and would have done it if nobody would have ever listened and finally did it in front of our cameras in Carnegie Hall and they were like the Beatles. Wow. That, you see, I have to contradict you. I thought I was doing a music documentary and I thought this was as close as I've ever been to a proper documentary. Mm -hmm. And I sat in my editing room and I realized I was editing something that I had followed believing I was doing a documentary, but I was editing a fairy tale. I just had the sheer luck to be present. It's kind of funny to think about, because when you're doing narrative films, you're almost doing documentaries, and when you're doing documentary films, you're almost doing narratives. That's kind of a profound thing to think of, the parallel. That's what it is. I mean, so you were nominated for an Academy Award for documentary for that film. You've since gone on to do another Academy Award-nominated documentary, Pina, which is just coming out right now, which tells the story of uh, Pina Bausch. What was the process of that film like? I know originally you were planning on making the documentary while she was still alive. What was your relationship with her before the film began? Did you know her? Did you know of her work? What exactly was the process there? We knew each other for a a good 20 years already for more than that, for almost a quarter of a century. And I loved her work. I had not been into dance at all. Actually, been. it was not my cup of tea. Mm-hmm. I, I, you'd have to force me to see <laughs> an evening of dance. And my girlfriend at the time did force me. She ended up playing the trapeze artist in Wings of Desire, wow. two years later. And she forced me to go see this double bill of Pina Bausch in the beautiful city of Venice, Italy, one, s- one summer evening in 85. Hmm. And I really was ready for a boring night. And I, <laughs> when I saw the poster, 
And she said, that's what we're going to do tonight. As I realized this was dance, and I said, oh, no, mm. certainly not. And she, I was, I caved in, and then it was the most unbelievable night of my life. Wow. It was life-changing. I was, I was struck by an emotion that I'd never see, had from any movie, from any screen experience, from any stage experience. It was devastating. I cried through the entire thing, not knowing what happened to me. And I knew I had to meet this woman, Pina Bosch, and I did meet her, even in Venice. And we did become friends over the years, and the project of a film together started very early, even in the 80s. Mm. And it had me who had been suggesting it, and Pina then had picked up on it, and eventually then pushed for it and said, you've been talking for it about it for so long, let's do it. And that's when the problem started, because I sat down, if you want to do a film about something, you have to have a, an idea how to do it. Mm. And I sat down and tried to imagine it and tried to write down a concept or a treatment, and I realized I did not know how to do it. And basically the problem was I did not know how to film dance. I thought... Mm -hmm. I thought my craft didn't have the goods, and I could only disappoint Pina because I felt whatever my cameras would do would be such a far cry away from what actually happened on her stage that I didn't dare doing it, and I didn't dare disappointing her, and that took 20 years. Interesting, and that's where you know the 3D aspect of it comes in, because Pina isn't necessarily, I, again, it's, it's sort of funny to think about that it's not r exactly a documentary. It sort of ventures back towards that narrative realm. And the 3D definitely adds an element of, um, to the experience, almost like you're seeing it live. Well, the attitude behind the film is strictly documentary. We wanted to share with as many people as possible this beauty and this unbelievable power that and this new invention because Pina has invented something new mm -hmm. that didn't exist before I just wanted to share just with the old man when I was the social club I loved their music and I figured I wanted to share this music with other people and the same motivation drove us to shoot Pina I just wanted to pass the virus to as many people as possible. <laughs> and that basically is a documentarian approach. You just yeah. want to represent something that you like as good as possible. And then, of course, with Pina, the, it is, as you sort of said well, a little bit, what was in front of the camera was fiction. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of the experience. Like, I had heard it was a documentary. I, I mm -hmm. went in to, su to see it. And then, you know, you, you interview the, 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 the dancers and you sort of have them talk about their experiences with Pina. But the majority of the film is the dances themselves, which are sort of narrative stories in and of themselves, even though they might yeah. be documented like a documented film. Yeah. What was the process like in sort of figuring out how to construct this movie because you have you have like a stage set sort of that you film some of the sequences in. you have outdoor locations you have the interludes with the people that you interview how did you sort of find the voice of this movie if if i can sort of describe it as that because you know it, it seems like there could be any number of ways to make this film you know interview subjects film, dance, but you sort of had a balance going throughout where it was not just one sort of thing. Well, it was a slow process. It was a very slow process. It took us a long time. It all started, of course, with the unimaginable that Pina died just when mm. we were ready to make the movie. And after dreaming it up for 20 years, when we were finally ready, she... she was gone. So I walked away from the film. I, for me, it was all over. It was too much based on her and based on the desire to film her work. And it was, I wanted to make a documentary about how Pina saw. Mm. I wanted to watch her eyes at work. And that was no longer possible. So I pulled the plug. And then we made the movie, after all, two months later, 
because the dancers didn't walk away and they persisted and they continu- decided to continue as a company and eventually started to rehearse the pieces that Pina had put on the agenda mm-hmm. of the company so we could film them. And that's when I realized it was a crying shame not to film them. And it was wrong and Pina would have really expected me to do it. So, But of course we couldn't, the concept for the film that we wanted to do was completely obsolete. That film was gone forever. And if I was going to do another film, it couldn't be a film with Pina anymore. It was necessarily going to be a film for Pina and about Pina. So it was a quite an adventure that the dancers and I sort of together jumped in because we had no clue. Uh, there was no concept. We yeah. had to slowly Start find from it ground out. zero again. Yeah, it was. When we started, we had no clue how to make a film together and what it could be, what it could consist of. Oh, it's, it's, it came out pretty amazing. So you've got Pina coming out now. You've got, got the Academy Awards uh, a week from now, which we wish you good luck with. Um, what is next? I know I've heard you speak about doing a 3D architectural movie. Are there any other things that you want to sort of give people a heads up that, that you're working is on? That is a long-term project, the film about architecture, and will certainly last a number of years because it's also about places where there's nothing yet, and Hopefully, when the film is done, there will be buildings. Mm. So, it'll last a number of years. And I'll do a feature film next, actually, a family drama. Very cool. Um, In 3D. It seems to be the way things are going these days, I guess. No, not these days. I wish more people would sort of take it more seriously and, and actually try how to do things in 3D and not just how to rake in the money. Yeah, I wish you were right on that. And uh, so I'm anxious to try to do some storytelling in this fantastic new language. That's good. As you said, uh, unfortunately, Hollywood seems to be trying to make a little bit too much money and not really figure out how to use 3D as a storytelling. Well, they mean. haven't even started to take it seriously. Well, they have started. I mean, Scorsese with Hugo certainly took it seriously. And Werner Herzog with and the Werner, cave. Well, yeah, Werner dreams. with the cave. I mean, there's the few first few films now, the first handful of films already, that are showing us the endless possibilities mm-hmm. of this new language. So you've got your films in theaters. Do you have a website or anything that people can check oh, yes, out your work and absolutely. keep up to tabs? What is that? Absolutely, and it's a great website, and people like it a lot. It's my name, but with a hyphen of vim minus vendors dot com. All right, there you have it. You find um, out everything about me. Thank you so much, Vim, and you can check out more interviews at our website, mcguffinpodcast dot com. And we wish you luck at the Academy Awards and at the screening tonight at Cinerama. Thanks a lot. Take good care, and s- salute Hitchcock for me. We'll do that. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. This tight don't even try to bite the side of style. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.